There's a lot of things you could be doing with your Friday night and having an intersectional conversation about something that's part of all of our lives in some way is how you chose to spend that Friday night. And that's amazing. So thank you so much for being here. And I would be really corny to ask you to give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> I'm the creative culture manager here at the Line Hotel DC. Uh, <laughs> don't do that. Um, this is my favorite part of my job is not just hiring awesome photographers or finding artists to work with, but um, creating a place that we can have really important conversations that can be awkward, can be heated, but that doesn't mean that they don't need to happen for people to like function as a whole society that looks out for each other. Uh, so we're really excited to work with Sprudge. We're really excited to work with Michelle. This is the first time this event has happened in DC. Uh, and honestly, I am just really excited to listen a lot and probably laugh with this crew that we have. So I'm gonna welcome uh, Michelle up right now. Thank you. Hi everyone. Welcome to Black Coffee. <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and get in and seat, but. I got some things to say. <laughs> Hi, oh, so this is my hometown show because I'm from DC. <laughs> but this is the first time I've done a coffee thing here since I left five years ago. Uh, I started working in coffee at Tynan Coffee and Tea like 2011 and I was so stoked on it. Um, my boss, like, she started teaching me things and I went home and like make flashcards and obsess over this shit, so. That's where it started. And then I went to, do y'all know Bayou Bakery in Virginia? The beignets. <laughs> I worked there for a while um, and got an especially coffee. And that just kind of got me where I am now. Um, so yeah, tonight's conversation. <clears throat> the reason why I wanted to do a black coffee in DC is because not only this is where I started, but it wasn't until after I left that I realized that the rest of coffee culture as a whole is not like how it is here. Everywhere else, um, it's pretty whitewashed. It's pretty stale, to be honest. The throwdowns aren't lit. No one drinks as much as we do here. <laughs> so I, so my whole uh, idea of what coffee culture was like was just based off of my experience here. And it wasn't until I moved to Phoenix five years ago that I was like, oh, wow, like... I think people are boring everywhere else, <laughs> but also the communities just w wasn't nearly as uh, tight knit as the DC coffee community is. Um, so what's super cool about DC is that it doesn't matter if you are like a coffee nerd and are super into the industry. You're not like, I notice a lot of people here uh, and are, I don't think most of y'all like work in coffee, but you go to a coffee shop every day um, they're all over the place. They're really good ones here. Um, so it's more DC itself is a culture city. And I feel like that translates really well into the coffee scene here as, um, too. But I also noticed that coffee everywhere else just wasn't as black as it is here. And I mean, coffee all over the place is still, it's still a white person thing. They like that shit. But <laughs> here, and in just the DMV area in general, like black people like that shit too. Um, so you have places like Busboys and Poets and um, like the coffee shop here at the line and the Y Down and all these places. And it's just like, you go in there and like, you feel comfortable. Like you see people that look like you and um, people behind the bar look like you. And I always had black baristas that I was working with, black managers. I easily saw myself as a manager and took that uh, and ran with it. So this conversation is going to be like a celebration of DC coffee. Um, a lot of the people who are on the panel all hold very different positions. So it's not all baristas. It's not all business owners. We have a roaster, an educator, uh, a coffee director. And it was very easy for me to find black people that held all those different positions because that's just DC. Um, so yeah, I'm very excited. I will preface right now. We're not really gonna be talking to you. We're gonna be talking to each other. and Y'all just had to pay to watch us talk. So <laughs> thank you for that. Um, all of the money for tonight is going to the Collective uh, for Safe Spaces cast, and we are very excited to be donating that money. Um, also, I wanna go ahead and take a moment to thank Sprudge, my producers, for, for being 
awesome and helping me put this together. And our sponsors, La Marzocco, Oli, and obviously the Line Hotel. Y'all hooked it up. I have not left this building today except to go down the street <laughs> to get some falafel. Um, so yeah, welcome. Enjoy the conversation. Uh, don't know where it's going to go, but that's just, that's what it be like. Uh, so the first person I'm going to call on stage, he was a part of the first black coffee in Portland earlier this year. And he works at the Potter's House. He works for the Barista Guild of America as the executive council. He's the first black person to ever be on the council. Please welcome Adam Jackson Bay. <laughs> Actually, before we get started, I'm going to pour myself some wine. Yeah. How are you, Adam? Living the dream. <laughs> I'm sorry. Same. So what, what are you doing here? You're not from D.C., are you? Um, no, I'm from Cleveland, Ohio. Um, I'm very proud of that, um, actually. And I, um, when people ask me like where I'm from in coffee, I typically always say that like I'm from Ohio, but I live in D.C. because that's a very important distinction to me. Um, like one being Ohio, Ohioan is really important, but also like there's um, a different culture that comes from being a D.C. native that I don't share, and like I don't want to like co-opt that in any way. Honestly. First of all, why did you come to D.C.? <laughs> um, I had never left Ohio um, in my entire life, and my fraternity brothers gave me $1,500, said I could move to D.C. and New York. Um, and I, um, New York was, like, big and fast and busy, and I liked D.C., and um, I just decided to move to D.C. Like, that's, it, there's, it's a much long, longer story than that, but that's, like, the bare bones of it. So did you get your start in coffee here? Or by the way, we won't be passing the mic back and forth between all seven of us tonight. Just me and Adam have to share. <laughs> but yeah, did you get started in coffee here or what's your story? Um, There's uh, two stories kind of like one I started. I was working at Marvelous Market um, on 13th and K and we kind of sold coffee there. Um, we sold Mayorga. And then um, I went to go work at a gelato shop. And like right when I started working there, about two or three months later, um, we switched from the roaster we were using to counterculture. Got a chance to take some counterculture classes, got really into coffee, found it was a thing I was good at. Um, then like a couple years later, um, I got, uh, well, I was diagnosed with cancer and my boss told me like, you need to find something you care about. And so that was five years ago, and I got really into coffee after that. So I've been in coffee overall, it'll be seven years since I passed my coffee test next month. But, like, I've been, like, good at coffee, in theory, for, like, the past five. Bet. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and call up our next person. This person has been in D.C. Coffee forever. Uh, he, I remember seeing him at Throwdowns. Um, I remember him at the last throwdown I was at before I moved to Phoenix, and I was a wine drunk. Let's just say that. Uh, but I met him there, and he's still here. Let's please welcome Reggie Elliott. This is it. Why? Lucini pouring from the sky. Let's get rich. Why? The GK Fonz is sugar dime. Can't quit. Why? Now pop the coke in the fake. Why? I had to. Why? Introducing. Hi, Reggie. <laughs> what up? What are you doing here? Um, I'm here to talk about coffee. Oh, word. And being black. That's what we're talking about? <laughs> That's Mostly the latter. So you've been around for a bit. How long? Not forever. By well, the way. You, you've been around since Murky, and that's a while. <laughs> this is true. 11 years Damn. as of like this month. Wow. Why do you say? <laughs> I like it. <laughs> so why do you stay? What do you love about DC? Um, what I love about DC, I mean, that's where I grew up. I love the culture. I love the I love it's ever forever changing. I love the energy. I don't know. I just I love DC. But for a while there, you lived in Sweden. Yeah, yeah. 
Oh. <laughs> why was <laughs> Well, I'm not going to ask you why you moved to Sweden, but you what can. are... Okay, why'd you move to Sweden? I met a Swedish girl. True. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I met a Swede, moved over there, made coffee over there too, because Swedes love coffee, lots of it. Um, and yeah, I don't know. So besides the obvious racial difference between here and Sweden, um, <laughs> <laughs> what what is the what are some of the differences in coffee culture between the two places? Um, I guess the biggest thing is like there's this concept called fika. Some of you may have heard of it, some of you haven't, but it's essentially it's a it's a break in the day. It's like built into everyone's day where you sit and you have coffee and or tea and snacks <laughs> with. A person that's also like if you go on a date you don't really go like out to a bar for dinner you go to fika like you have a coffee or whatever and it's like it's just built into the culture and like, i like that idea um the idea of coffee not just being a vehicle for caffeination but a vehicle for conversation and building relationships which is what we're here about and so for you've been here 11 years how have you seen the scene change <laughs> um, well, it's it's just grown rapidly, um, and I guess for the most part, for the better. Um, from a few, from a handful of small specialty shops to multiple specialty shops, like just on 14th Street. Um, mm -hmm. Now people will actually walk down 14th Street. <laughs> I remember when, like, if you're one of Sparkies, you ran a Sparkies because you don't want to like <laughs> you don't want to like spend too much time there. Um, so like it's just it's changed. It's like you can find coffee anywhere you go. Um, whenever whenever someone asks me, hey, I need a recommendation for coffee, I just ask them where are they, and then I'll say, okay, well, if you're there, then you go to the spot, this spot, or that spot, and I think that's pretty cool. So for the both of you, you run DMV Coffee, which is an organization here that puts together throwdowns and events, longest running throwdowns in the country. Yep. This the ten year anniversary one was last night. Yep. That's the set. That's the set. So since you both are DC people here, I want to ask, why do you think why do you think DC has been able to kind of uphold um, being as diverse as it is, even through coffee, where in so many other cities the you know gentrification comes through and usually coffee is like a the first degree of that about to happen but it seems like in dc it still stays pretty pretty cultured Ooh. oops might be what are your thoughts on that and why that is Go ahead. um i think one like for the baristas in the city is um because uh, TNTs have been going on for so long. We all kind of know each other. So, like, we see each other, like, all the time. Like, I've seen the same people come to TNTs now for the past four or five years. Um, so that's part of it. And then, like, it's, um, it's, it's a small enough city that you can go visit a bunch of shops in one day. Um, and, like, we all, like, have a genuine respect for each other, um, which is wild helpful. Um, yeah, I think that's, like, most of it. Like, it stays diverse because, like, when you have the people that are trainers or managers or um, just baristas that are, like, not white dudes, like, they tend to hire people that also aren't white dudes. So, like, it that cycle, like, keeps happening. So, like, that's how it stays diverse. And then, like, it's, I don't know, like, it's, it's the coolest coffee city I've ever worked in. So, yeah. I'll go ahead and ask this question now, but I also want everyone else's opinion on it. Why do you think DC doesn't get nearly as much shine as other coffee cities? <laughs> um, that's a good question. Um, I, probably because we don't do, we don't, I don't know. I don't, you've been to other coffee cities. You have more experience. I think it's because we're blacker. Right. I like I, 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 I wasn't gonna say like it. I was, <laughs> but I guess this is a place to say it. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like I, 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 I honestly do think that it's because there are so many people of color working in DC, um, and we don't have like, um, 
I don't know, like shop. Never mind, I'm not going there. Um, Drink some more. Yeah, yeah, it's early. Uh, <laughs> we we um, and and because we all get along, and there isn't really like a lot of strife, as there like like from what I've heard from other cities. Um, but I think that because like when you think about DC, you think about like uh, the monuments or um, the presidency or like whatever. You never think about coffee and so like there's a lot of other cities that um they don't have like that touchstone so it becomes coffee Mm -hmm. so that that Mm -hmm. helps too but i do think that because like when i think about great baristas in dc i think about mostly women and black people and those people aren't really shown on the national stage in coffee a lot yeah agreed (laughs) (laughs) no i was gonna say like as far as like people thinking of dc you mentioned all those things yeah people don't actually think about the people in dc All right, well, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our next guest. She owns a roastery called the Southeastern Roastery here in the district. Her name is Candy Shebley. Please call on out. (laughs) Wait, hold on. Is it right? God bless you. (laughs) Hi, Candy. Hi. Oh, is your mic on? I don't know if it's oh, on. Oh, yes. there, there we on. go. It's on. Excellent. What's up? It wasn't on in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's what you think. <laughs> How are you, Candy? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? I'm good. What are you? What's up with your your roastery? I'm so stoked on a black woman owning a roastery out here. <laughs> <laughs> and you're from DC, so that's lit. But yeah, tell tell us about you. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I was born in Lawton, Oklahoma. <laughs> uh, my parents were in the, uh, my dad was in the military, grew up in Richmond, Virginia, and then outside of, of D.C. So um, when I went to undergrad, I went in for chemical engineering, and my idea was to go into environmental engineering at first. And so... Uh, I quickly realized that the environment of an engineer is, was one that I did not want to be in for the rest of my life. <laughs> After my first job in Ashland, Kentucky, which was in a very rural community, very removed, um, you know, I kind of realized the environmental impact that a uh, chemical industry has, um, you know, more from a uh, firsthand perspective uh, on the communities. Um, that they're in. And so I wanted to get into something that was a little bit more socially conscious um, and environmentally friendly. So I went back to school for international affairs, natural resources, and sustainable development, did a year in Costa Rica, and got introduced to coffee that way. And so studying uh, international affairs, getting more acquainted with agriculture. Uh, We always grew up with gardens. Mm -hmm. My family has gardens, farms. So yeah, kind of Felt at home to me, so that's how I got into coffee. So when did you start roasting? 2016. Nice. I have not been roasting long at all. There are people who have been roasting for much shorter times who shouldn't be doing it all together. (laughs) (laughs) So you're good, girl. (laughs) So what are some of the challenges that you've seen in trying to get a roastery up and up to get a roastery started, and I know you're also trying to find a space right now for your roastery. Mm-hmm. Uh, so how's that going? It's going. It's going. It's uh, it's a long process, particularly here in D.C. I don't think D.C. is very manufacturing friendly, mm-hmm. and I consider uh, roasting a manufacturing process. I mean, if you want to, if you want to grow, you need the space. Um, you need a facility. It's basically for me, a smaller chemical facility. Um, and the city is not, uh, not, I don't think it's as friendly as it could be for manufacturing. And a lot of the commercial spaces that are warehouses or are larger spaces, um, the price per square foot is, is fairly high. Um, and people that do own them, um, some of the ones that are empty are sitting on them because they know that they can get a high price from a developer or a buyer. And so, you know, they, they might want somebody in for like a year, a year and a half. And, you know, to move roasting equipment up for a year and a half is just like, why, why would I do that? Why would I spend the, mm-hmm. spend the money to do that? So, yes. Yeah, it's been difficult. Yeah. Are you still finding success in, in wholesale and whatnot? 
I am. I am. And I, I, because I think I, I come from a science background and an engineering background, I wouldn't consider myself a people person. (laughs) (laughs) Real? (laughs) Me either. (laughs) And so. I was going to say, you're kind of rude, Candy. Yeah, no, right. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm very much comfortable in like the back end and the, the end of coffee from production to kind of roasting. And, and, and that's where I love to be. Um, so as far as the, the kind of the coffee shop, the customer facing front end, well, I think that's fun and it's necessary and it's uh, very important. Um, I definitely uh, would like to grow the wholesale aspect of, of my business first and foremost before, you know, exploring any other opportunities. So. Well, if anyone needs coffee, she's right here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Our next guest, uh, is, she works here at The Line. She is the coffee director of Cup We All Race For Upstairs. Her name is Victoria Smith. If you'd like to come out, please. <laughs> And see, this is what I mean. DC is so damn lit. Jesus. Lit. Oh my God. I mean, the other panels were like this too, but like, I just, as soon as I got here, I was like, oh, it's time to start drinking. (laughs) It's time to do something. I got into a lot of trouble out here. Uh, My friends that I grew up with are all here and they know. (laughs) What's up, Victoria? Hi. What are you doing? How are you doing? I'm okay. Yeah. <laughs> what are you? A little tipsy, I'll be honest. <laughs> but I'm okay. That's fine. I'm here. How long have you been in coffee out here? Oh, man. I think about eight years. Oh, wow. Really? Yeah. Where? I think my first real coffee experience started at Baked and Wired. Shout out Baked and Wired. That's Baked a spot. Wired. That's a spot. <laughs> we have some big people here. Um, I didn't... I started on baked sides. So I wasn't like into coffee, but that was like my first experience of like a coffee shop. And that's when I fell in love. And I was like, this is where I need to be. This is my people. They're creative. They're great. My friends, I like, I was born in DC, but I grew up in Fairfax. I always felt like I needed to come to the city to be productive, to be doing something. And then I, that's where I felt like I met my tribe. And I've been stuck in it ever since. Do you feel like it was? It was easy for you to see yourself and like jumping into something as wild as coffee and like being able to uh, stay in it for so long and have like upward mobility and whatnot? No, absolutely not. (laughs) Um, Well, when I was at Big starting out, it wasn't even a thought to get into coffee. It felt very like separated. It was like, all right, you're on this side, they're on that side. And it was a lot of like the white male baristas that were doing coffee and everybody else just, you know, we're doing pastry. So that's what it felt like for a while. Then I moved on over to Dolceza and worked my way from, you know, barista all the way up to, you know, shift leads, manager, trainer. And I felt like I put time in there, a lot of time. And now I'm finally here. <laughs> So what do you want to do? I want to have my own coffee shop. I want to have my own spot uh, <laughs> where I can, you know, do the things that I've learned. You know, over time, coffee is like family, friends. You know, you see the same faces every single day. You build that community. You have, you know, creative people. I feel like a lot of times coffee shops are a place for people trying to find themselves. They don't know exactly what they're doing yet. You have, like, people who are, like, coffee professionals. Like I see myself like I'm in it. You have people who are want to be photographers, want to be actors, want to be writers, want to be doctors. And they're there for a moment in time. But I feel like they learn something there and they make friends for life. So it's a good place. It's just like a melting pot of everyone. Yeah. That's just that. Well, I look forward to going. <laughs> So our next guest is actually all the way coming from Baltimore. I love this place so much. I wrote about them for Sprudge last year. Please welcome Aisha Pugh from Doveco Cafe. (laughs) 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 (laughs)
chose this song. <laughs> That's what you picked, DJ. You knew. Uh, no, I picked that. Uh, that was me. I picked that. <laughs> Last minute, that's a lot of pressure. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to live a free life. How are you, Aisha? I'm always pretty good. Yeah, you just came from a panel. <laughs> I did just come from a panel. <laughs> You're busy. What, what y'all got going on up in Baltimore? That's a big question. What don't we have? Go- well, you know. Baltimore is about the liberation of black people right now. Oh, so yeah. there's a lot happening. Yeah. So we're living our best black lives up there. What y'all doing down here? <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, it was a fight for <laughs> Well, <laughs> we have a resident we're trying to get out of here. Hey, we got someone we're trying to evict. Wait, what'd you say? I said we got a resident we're trying to evict. Oh, uh, we well, we y'all gotta be 16, like Zimbabwe. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why people invite me to panel. This is exactly I why I invited you to this. I'm trying to behave tonight. No, but for real. What, what's going on at Dove Coat up there? Mm, so Dove Coat just celebrated three years. Nice. Woo! We're very excited. It's our community anniversary. Um, and I think that we finally, you know, like, the Underground Railroad was, like, underground for a while. And then, like, you had to come above ground because you're free. So I think we're, like, moving from being from a place to being underground to now being able to talk about nice. the real work that we're doing. And so we, um, in addition to having Dove Coat, just opened another location Purchased two more buildings, and we're about to take over Public Market. Wow. Um, wow. Yeah. Is good. And we have an art bazaar tomorrow, so, you know, come down. Yeah, or go uh, up. you right. <laughs> so do you think, um, or where do you think the, the cafe has a place in, in liberating a black neighborhood? Because typically mm-hmm. you think of a cafe coming in and it's it's about gentrification. It's about the opposite happening, sweeping them out. But you're doing, you're bringing them in. Them being black people? Yes. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, them being black people. Who's yeah. Them? yeah. <laughs> when I talk about them, I don't mean black people. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so, <laughs> um, yeah, so I think if you've been to Dove Coat, Dove Coat is like blackity black. Black layers of black, like loud, like, like music's loud, people's loud. Um, so I think the con- and there's cross aisle conversations about the the need for safe spaces for black people. So we talk about that every day, all day, and so um, and then we do a lot around home buyer education, and so. Dove Coat was meant to be an inward pull to start having a conversation of what it means to take back our neighborhoods. And so I'm originally from Brooklyn, New York, and we had... There's not anyone from Brooklyn? <laughs> Come on, girl. I was like, okay, no. That's always a, like, it's a call and response. So I'll try that again. So I'm originally from Brooklyn, New York. Brooklyn! <laughs> Thank you. Um, and, but, you know, but of the 80s. So if you're thinking current Brooklyn... But of the 80s, where there were always black businesses, and that was actually the anchor to a black neighborhood. And so this idea that nice amenities, beautiful spaces mean whiteness, we have to deconstruct that. That beautiful spaces mean stay in your hood, invest in your hood, buy your your buy your homes, continue to rent, but with intention around what renters' rights are, but to stay put because we continue to be nomadic people because the first thing that they do is pull our commercial spaces away from us and make us think that we then can't invest as an entrepreneur in our own neighborhoods. So people told me, like, Black people don't drink coffee. Where? I'm like, well, Black people pick coffee. Black people pick coffee. It doesn't make any sense. Like, I and that is that on that. that. And your own supply, but like... So this idea that we're not, we can't be our own consumers just needs to be deconstructed. And so I think that's been, um, I know we're not supposed to talk to the audience. No, no, it's okay. You can, you can acknowledge that. So I'm just, I'm just just really excited that Dove Coat is able to tell a different story. And if anybody's like, well, you're gentrifying the neighborhood. I'm like, no, you're the problem because you're not seeing the bigger picture. So if you're coming in, we might be willing to like, um, yeah, I moved to the neighborhood because of Dove Coat. We're like, well, you can move out because of Dove Coat because you missed the message then of Dove Coat. 
And so it's really important to tell the story around a business that is for us to be an impulse to buy and own new neighborhoods and then invest both commercially and residentially. Amazing. I love that. Well, we need more, y'all. More dove coats all over. Every city. <laughs> Yeah. Maybe in the future. It's no, it's happening. It's happening. We just need to pay attention. Yeah. You know, it's happening. And I think you know, I just want to thank you because I think you do a really incredible you just you you nail it. Like you don't care what platform you're on, you you have a voice and you have a perspective and you tell the story the way it's meant to be and like and you're about highlighting what's really going on. Um and so I just really appreciate you. I appreciate you for this event. Um, I appreciate you for the feature you did on Delco, and I appreciate you for using your voice to continue to tell a story that can be like sidebarred. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm tired of us being silent. So, and for our last guest from Vigilante Coffee. Of course, he's last. Of course he's last, because he's the last one here today. <laughs> Dante Gardner. What's up, Dante? <sighs> How y'all doing? We're good. How are you? Long enough, man. <laughs> How's Vigilante? Vigilante is cool. Yeah. What are you it's doing fun. over there? Uh, I'm the cafe manager, so I pretty much see the everyday uh, wholesale, you know, pretty much everyday operations, day in, day out, you know, so mm-hmm. manage the whole crew. So, it's How- cool. It's okay. I like my job. <laughs> <laughs> you feel supported? You feel like you can, you can do what you need to do? You got oh, the yeah, support absolutely. and encouragement it's, you it's, need? Yeah. You know, I, I'm in a good position, so it's just a, that's what it's about, you know, putting yourself in position. Yeah. That you were in control of, you know, and you grind. Go get it. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> no, yeah, you know, you know what I'm talking about. I feel like for the most part, just like in what kind of differs DC amongst other things is that for everyone who works in coffee here that's black, overall they feel supported and like they feel like they can go on and do whatever it is that they want to do in coffee. Do you all feel that way? I mean, Aisha, you can do whatever you want to do because you own the thing. Is that how it works? (laughs) Sorry, I told the sound. (laughs) But like you also, like you support your employees to, you know, go do what it is that they like to do to follow their dreams, whether that's in coffee or not. But do the rest of you all feel that way about where you are or in D.C. as a whole? It's okay to spill tea. <laughs> I'm just saying. Reggie spilled the tea. I ain't, ain't spilling no tea. <laughs> I, don't know, I, I don't know. I mean, I think there's a lot of work that we could be doing. And, and maybe we don't have, I don't know if all those opportunities are there for us still. I think there are more of them. Um, but there's a long way. There's a lot of work for us to be, like, a lot of work to be done. Mm-hmm. And I just, I mean, I mean, obviously this is a good start. This is proof that there is like steps have been taken, and then that we are moving forward. But it's like there's a few little blocks. Where there. have you seen some barriers? Hmm. And anyone can answer this question, please. I would say, I mean, uh, from a roasting perspective, in in pricing, in in price per square foot. Um, and I don't think it's necessarily, you know, just, um, I don't think it's special, you know, to, to me being a roaster per se. I think it's artists. I think it's entrepreneurs in general are in DC in particular are having a more difficult time, um, as time goes on, both living here, starting a business here and growing the business here um, and working here. I mean, it's it's difficult to expand here with the uh, housing prices, with the cost of living, um, with, you know, property prices. Um, you know, there there are ways to, to getting um, 
to get around some of that stuff. Um, but I think as black people, we have, um, you know, other barriers that we have to, to, to cross even before that point. Um, you know, just in access to capital, women in particular, um, are, uh, usually less funded in, in, in getting capital and getting loans, loans for businesses, um, start up and seed money, uh, you know, just having knowledge about uh, first-time homebuyer programs, um, grants that are available. You just have to really be extremely proactive and extremely persistent. Um, and that's fine. I think it's, it's anywhere you go, you're going to have to have to do that. But it's particularly hard in an environment that is uh, so, so expensive. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, basically, I want to say what Candy said. Like, I've been trying to open a coffee shop for two years, and it's anywhere from a quarter of a million to three quarter of a million dollars to open a shop in D.C. Like, and that's a very conservative estimate. Um, like, rent's really high if you want to pay people properly. Um, and by properly, I mean $14, $15 an hour for doing their job to train them correctly. And that's, like, barely paying myself anything. So, like, that's like the major barrier because like a lot of people are like the traditional you know, of like uh, a coffee professional is to like difficulty. Yeah. <laughs> you good? Put it on your hair. Yeah. Help me out. You call, <laughs> call a technical timeout real quick. <laughs> that was a brief yeah, 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 clear right. right. That was cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> See, each yeah, one. man. Yeah, yeah, there's a couple. Other, that yeah. black woman, I tell you, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> oh, God. Thank you, Dante. Um, <laughs> no, but, like, it's um, it's an uphill battle a lot because um, there was a report that came out recently, I want to say within, like, the past, I don't know, six months to a year. I, was, I saw it on Twitter, so it could have been, like, Yesterday, for all I know, honestly. Um, but <laughs> it's that black people don't, like, we're, like, a generation removed in general from poverty. And so, like, when you, have, when you look at people that own coffee shops, um, in general, they're able to raise that capital because they have friends and family members that they can count on to help raise that capital. And a lot of us don't have that support network that they do. So it makes... Um, us moving forward in a lot of ways, or just like being able to, um, like I'm, like I said, I moved out here because my fraternity brothers gave me fifteen hundred dollars. Like, like, like otherwise, I'd still be in Cleveland, Ohio, and probably working construction. You know, like, like that's that's what I'd be doing. So it's like it's it's not easy for us to move forward because we don't have like the financial capital to start out with. So like we're gambling every time we take a risk for our careers. So it's it's kind of hard in that way. But at the same time, too, I'd like to say that, uh, you know, there, there's, there are so many opportunities in community as well. Like, all of us up here are a part of the coffee community, you know, from D.C. to Baltimore to Philly, down to Richmond. Um, the coffee community is, is growing. Mm-hmm. It's tight. And it's tight. It's very tight. And so I think... The more challenges we have, the more opportunities there are for us to um, lean on one another for um, the things that we need to leverage and the gaps that we need to fill. And I think in doing that, we create a stronger community. And I think what um, Dove Cup Cafe uh, is doing is is a good example of that. So. I'll pay you later. <laughs> I appreciate that. But I, you know, I do think it's true. Like, I think that we just one, like this idea of hoarding information, hoarding information, like that sufficiently black history. Like, we need to move forward as like open books, open like whatever I have, you have. And I, I literally mean that. Like, even to say to Candy, like if she has to put her roaster in the middle of our cafe, like she's gonna find space. And so. I think it's, it's this idea of making sure that we don't think, like when you, you were on another panel and they were talking about like bootstrapping, I guess that's like the catchy word for like, that's like, 
What about like community strapping? And so I think that we've forgotten that like, we actually have continuously held each other down. Like that has been um, what has gotten us to this point. And so this idea like that we're on our own, like that's some like white man, like I, I did it on my own, like white man, please. <laughs> <laughs> so one, we have to stop like reinventing that conversation amongst ourselves. Like I'm out here trying to pull myself up. Like don't, don't do that. Like Dove Coat didn't come up because it was just me or because it was just me and my partner and it's just me and my partner and Nicole. It was like our community rallied behind us. Like when we bought our building, we did a crowdfunding campaign and like it funded like, like this, not because like we were out here like making a story about ourselves, but because we relied heavily on each other. And so I think that that's important. Like, to just stop this mindset too, like I gotta make it happen all by myself. Like you gotta phone a friend. Like if yep. you're out here trying to do something and someone has already done it, like what a waste of me to be three years in the game and you're trying to get started and you haven't like been like, yo, eesh, what the <laughs> like that's that's a waste of my like intellectual capital. It's a waste wow. of my like all my learnings, it's a waste of like any bit of resource that I could provide. And so we need to just really be at a place where we're starting to come back to community and, and lean on each other because we are all we need. And so I think if anything that's been the model of Dove Coat, it's just like, I promise you I would say this, like, you know, we don't need shit from white people. Like I don't we don't need you said you were going to fall off the chair. I did say I would fall off the chair if you said that. There we go. You got me out. Yeah. And I think it's just it's just important to just be like, well, let me call on my tribe. Let me call on my people. Let's figure out how to get it done. And like, let's make it happen. It may not be the quarter of a million dollars or half a million dollars, but like, we can figure out how to get you a space, you know? And it may not, like, we don't have an espresso machine because I'm not... You know, especially when you would get this drip coffee. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you enjoy it. You can get milk. <laughs> you know, you can even get almond milk because you be. You know, we're out here trying to be an evolutionary people. So, but like, you can think about how to do it on a minimal, and we can even help with like the finances. But we have to like. We just need to be much more like, re re not reliant in this like dependency way, but reliant on one another mm -hmm. and feel like we are. Because like this seeking capital, we know they're not, they not, we know, we know they're not giving us money, but they're like, we have other ways of being resourceful. And I think we just need to like always move from a place of abundance, from a place of community. I agree. Thank you. Yeah. And like the community aspect is what so of DC is what surprised me that so many other coffee cities just don't have. Like they are very dog eat dog. Yep. Like everyone holds information, keeps it in white or black. And but in most of the other cities, there aren't other black people. So it's like they're <laughs> one of um, or one of a few, and they're in positions where you know they don't have you know a ton of power anyway, where they can do something. But it's like everyone here for the most part like run shit in their respective spot. Am I wrong? Yeah. Yeah, yeah you can say that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's about right. <laughs> well, Dante, you and I were talking last night, and your sort of approach to working in coffee is, is, is different than what most people do when they're working in coffee. They're, like, super passionate about it. This is, like, their entire life, and they don't want to do anything else, and to them it's just, like, passion over, you know, money. But... At the end of the day, and I, I think of it like this too. It's it's just a hustle. It's yeah. just it is just I a hustle. You yeah. can love it as much as you want to. <laughs> you broke at the end of the day. I mean, you know, you got to live at the same time. So yeah, yeah. So I just want to I want to talk about that a little bit more. Like, how are you doing coffee out here? How I'm doing it, I'm looking at it like. Uh, so I'm a football coach. So I kind of relate that to the coffee industry or how I go to work and whatnot. So most places, 
they have levels of um, specialty or experience, and you get priced by that. And depending on your performance, you know, the, 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 the blase where we get the, the scheming and how we do it. But for the most part, if the hustle is right and, you know, experience wise and just knowing how to position people in certain situations, for the most part, out of my 12 years, that was the name of the game coming in and out is how do we work through this and make this X amount of money and this X amount of time. If you do it at this rate, you're successful. If you don't do it slower than that, you know, looking for a certain number per hour. So it's different from loving the coffee. I'm good at it. And I know people that's really good at it, eye-hand coordination. They know all the information, but they're there for, like, the show. I'm going to show you how it's done, but they look fancy and play some Erykah or something like that. <laughs> and then at the end of the day, see what the numbers are. Okay, we made, you know, 2000 a day. We did well, you know. So it, approaching it from the aspect of it being more than just, you know, you can make it what you want to make it. Yeah. And majority of people that I work with, they're in it because they're passionate about their bean and the farmers and all that's cool, but you know, it's a, it's a business at the same time. So you know, I've learned that you just got to put yourself in situations, always be in control of the situation, and be don't be afraid to say no, like know your worth. You know what I mean? Yes. That's probably the most important thing is knowing your worth, and you know, and when it's time to put the work in. Put the work in. Don't just walk around with a big stick and don't know how to swing it. So <laughs> it matters. That's how you. That's how you get respected. You go in there, you push your work in. You know, the work. The work speaks for itself. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I like it though. It's it, it's a game to me. You know what I mean? Depending on how you approach it and what you want to get out of it. So currently. I'm working at Vigilante, but I'm also using that space to start a outreach training program for, you know, uh, underprivileged youth in PG County. So that's about it. But stuff like that. The coffee works for me, but I can use it to yes. do what I want at the same time. With it. Okay. You got your resources. Well, I was just going to kind of piggyback off that. It's also like... It's a skill set that many people like may not have known that they had. Right. Um, and like, I, I grew up. I was in the. I was an artist. I was like, when I was younger, I wouldn't like, oh, be a filmmaker. Be the next whoever. And then after a while, that became less and less practical. <laughs> and then I got a job in coffee. And I was like, I learned this skill that I could do with my hands, whereas other people build things, other people do whatever. I was like, hey, I can do this. I'm pretty good at it. And then when the opportunity came to like do it in an entirely other country, where I didn't know the language, didn't know the culture, I can still do that. Right. And like, right. I think that's pretty cool. And I think yeah. if you can teach people, like, hey, this is a it's a simple skill. Yeah. It's not complex, but you can take it anywhere you want and do with it, do whatever you want with it from there. And I think that's a pretty cool thing. When you all think of DC coffee, what comes to mind? How would you describe it to people who aren't from here? Since we consider, since we continue to get overlooked, and I don't know why. Do you mean DC and Baltimore? Yeah, like DMV. <laughs> DMV. There's an M in the middle. The DMV. Just checking when you said yeah, yeah, overlooked. Yeah. I was wondering who the they were. Yeah. <laughs> that 45 minute difference is a huge difference. <laughs> yeah, what do y'all think of? Community. I mean, we've been talking about it already, but I think that's the biggest thing that comes to mind. Is it? I mean, and. We've been trying to do stuff with Baltimore for a while, DMV Coffee, and like because we, we recognize like it's it's not just DC, yeah, but like there's that Parkway there, and it's not that far away, and like, we do need to like build like we have a community here. I know there's a community in Baltimore, and we have that. Like, it's organic. We build it ourselves, and I think that's the thing that stands out to me more than anywhere else. I think. I think the environment is is competitive yet friendly. I think it's a very nurturing yes. kind of competitive environment because there's so many people that know that are on their shit and know what they're doing here. <laughs> you know, from DC, uh, in Baltimore, you know, Richmond. down to Richmond. <laughs> you got people who are really on their game. And so I think it's it's a, it's nice because it keeps me on my toes. <coughs> And, you know, I have people that I can 
hang ideas off of and that I can talk to, you know, when I'm in a challenging situation and the community's here and yep. strong. So, yeah. And, and, and they might even be people that, you know, on the surface might seem like they're competitors, but really I think we're, we're all in the same game. You know what I mean? When we, and I think when, who better know, who better to know our challenges than ourselves, <laughs> you know? So it's a great learning environment, for sure. How do you, who do you think of? I think it's, obviously there's a community there, but it's a cool thing that we can rely on each other, that everybody's kind of like one step away from everyone. Yep. Like it's either I know you or I know of you or this person worked with that person. Like someone asked me the other day, they were like, oh, you, what are these like TNTs and you know, the barista community? Like, oh, you guys all know each other? And I was like, for the most part, yeah. <laughs> like if, you know, you, you'll always have a home. You'll always have a job for the most part or you won't have a job because <laughs> you <laughs> job and everybody yeah. knows about it. <laughs> but I know that at the end of the day that like I feel good about, like I can go to Reggie and be like, Reggie, I need a job. <laughs> you know, like, times are tough. Like, can you hook me up? And he'll look out, like, at any point and be like, yo, this person, go reach out to that person. I, uh, Adam, I feel like I can reach out to you for help. Like, I'm in this position now where I'm the coffee director, but I'm not, like, you know, 100% there. So I'm, like, working at it. And that's, like, I have these people that I can reach out to for help. Um, and that's a really cool thing. Um, also, if I'm like, hey, I need baristas, go to the shop, go to these friends, yay, <laughs> and be like, hook it up, bring this person over. So we all kind of like, it's like we're all working yes. together, even though we're in different shops, we're doing different things. Uh, I think the TNTs really bring that together, really hold that together. Yeah. No city does it like DC. That I'm is sorry so when it comes to these TNTs. Like I've been to other <laughs> cities. I've been to their throwdowns. They're boring. They're boring. <laughs> <laughs> They're not fun. These but are latte you, art throwdowns, by the way. Yeah, these the are latte art competitions. Don't when know we, what we're talking yeah, about. <laughs> we get They're, together. We throw down. We have fun. There's a party. You yes. know, we've got drinks. They're BYOB. We've got the twins spinning. <laughs> we've got Justin and Drew. It's not a party unless Justin and Drew are there. So. <laughs> It, and those are the things that make it feel like home. I've never understood why throwdowns aren't BYOB all over the place. I feel like that should be a baseline rule. Yeah. Yeah. I'm still so serious about it. Anyway. When I go someplace, I, I expect a drink to be served. Right. Maybe it's like a certain age. I'm not carrying E and J in my purse anymore. Like, I got to, like, grow up. So, like, when I get there, like, I want, I want it. And I want it to be free because I believe. You know, I think that you should have the option but I think the venue right. should also like come up off that liquor. Right? That's just, I'm up for reparations in all streams. So I just want to put that out there. Coffee, liquor, it Coffee doesn't matter. Liquor. Pastries. Yeah. Pastries. We, like when I think Cake. of it, I'm like, there needs Snacks, to be yeah. day old pastries, yeah. a big array of them. There needs to be a keg. I'm not drinking beer, but there needs to be a keg and there needs to be a DJ. If all those things are there, I know it's going to be lit. Yeah. I feel like this, like the rest of the world is going to watch this and be like, so this is why Michelle is the way she is. <laughs> this is exactly why I am the way I am. This is why the chocolate barista party is literally just a turn of <laughs> and not anything really coffee related. Um, Y'all should come to that next year. I'll bring a chocolate barista party to D.C. for yes. sure. There's always a Hennessy cocktail. So, yeah. I have some in the back, by the way. <laughs> That's why I came. You didn't ask me that question. <laughs> but when you think of Baltimore coffee, what comes to mind? You know, it's it's tricky because um, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't think that there's this, like, um, barista culture or a black barista culture, uh, but I don't know. Like, I, we sell coffee. I think we sell really good coffee. I think we're very mindful of the coffee we sell. But I don't think of us as in the coffee business. And so, um, and then I think of, like, the black-owned um, cafes and or, I guess they would call themselves cafes restaurants, you know, some of them feel more fancier than others in their minds. 
Um, and so <laughs> I think of them, and I think they're in the, the food business. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I know of, like, one, two dudes who are, like, about their craft, and I think that that's beautiful. Um, but in terms of what Dovecoat does... Um, and I think we're going to move that move away from that as we kind of think about like the coffee program that we offer. But again, like we're we're like sit down, drink this coffee. You ain't in a rush. <laughs> you know, we're going to take a, maybe six to fifteen minutes to warm your muffin. Like slow down, <laughs> build community. And so I, you know, yeah. it's just a very different business. It's more around the conversation. Yes. Over coffee yeah. than the literal like beverage. And so but I think that there's there's something amazing and I think the crew would be really interested because I don't even think they would call themselves like I said, we don't I think y'all call it a pulling espresso. Like we, <laughs> No. <laughs> <laughs> Most we pull our edges, like here, right here. But we don't, yeah. So I don't think in terms of like the craft, that's like where um, we're at. It's more like this concept around what coffee is to like sit down, engage with people, be known. Like it's very important to us that we know how you take your coffee. Because I feel like by the time you know how I take my coffee... It's an intimate experience. Yep. Oh, okay. You know, like, if I'm like, well, you go get me a coffee, either like, yeah, you know, it's in the morning. So yep. um, so I think that it's, it's like a very intimate experience to share with someone, like separate from like making the beautiful leaf designs that y'all do so perfectly <laughs> and I really appreciate. Like it's separate, like that's very important, but I think that there's a craft around how to use this for connectivity. How to use this to see the person in front of you? Because usually you see them every day. So knowing something about them, like that makes their life a little bit easier. So that like you're connecting with the person in front of you, I think has been like really our focus is around how do black people really get seen in this world? And if it starts with me pausing a little bit and saying like, talk to me about your coffee real quick. Like, no, you can't just get this cup and then go to like a bar and add milk or your almond milk like you have to tell me how you take it and while you're telling me i'm gonna ask about your mother i'm gonna ask about your badass kid that was running down the street i'm gonna ask you like these questions and like you're gonna we're gonna you're gonna be seen in this world and i'm and i'm gonna tell you about me because like i'm a person too and so and then i'm going to make this cup of coffee and you're going to wait for it because like we need to slow down in the world and i think coffee allows for that experience it allows for like levels of intimacy that at, at like living in this culture that we've been given removes that intimacy from what um, what we deserve, what makes us like full and holistic beings. I want to piggyback off of that because I think that is so important, and I think we really need to come back to that. Um, just a shout out to to Do a Cafe just for a second. <laughs> They're in the room. Um, but, uh, you know, when I was recently uh, traveling uh, to Indonesia, I really felt that 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 type of culture, um, I felt it as well when I was in Uganda. You know, it's like a very nice... <laughs> Uganda's in the house. <laughs> For Uganda. I can smell Brooklyn from here. <laughs> she's from Brooklyn is like cricket. So you got it. She's like, <laughs> <laughs> right. we living in a global world. <laughs> but, but really, coffee, like the culture around the communication, the slowing down of, of coffee, and really just kind of the, just the, the space that it gives people to kind of sit back, reflect, Yep. Think, talk, yep. communicate cross culturally is extremely important, and that's one of the things that um, you know drew me into to coffee, and that's something that I think is a value that should and needs to, and you know, and and, and my company will continue um, throughout existence. But I think bringing that into the community more and Letting people know that it, that that's a that's a global value. Yeah. Yep. You know, it's global. You can go to so many countries 
and find the same type of relationship building and camaraderie around coffee and really feel comfortable and confident and welcome and at home. And that's something that I think is really beautiful. I think um, it really helps to expand the mind, really helps to bring people together. And uh, I think that's something that we need more of. So, and yeah. Thanks for bringing that up. (laughs) Yeah, I feel like all of those things are so severely undervalued in the coffee industry. as one of the, as someone who considers themselves a coffee professional, um, being in it, it's very focused on the technical side of things, on the science, on the you know TDS and percentages of this and that or whatever. Whether it's over and under extracted, it's just like okay, cool, cool, cool. But <laughs> the what I've always thrived off of and what's continued to have me in coffee is is that community aspect and the fact that it brings people together and I feel like it's something that black people do so well naturally anyway we're just like a a, a people oriented people and I feel like coffee is the perfect place for us um, but because it, that that aspect of it is so undervalued and there's this huge focus on everything else, we feel like we don't you know have a have a space in this. Um, but I feel like we should be running the whole entire thing. And I will be <laughs> soon. <Yes. laughs> Eventually. Um, but to change gears a little bit, Adam, I want to talk to you a little bit about competition. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So for those of you that know, know, don't know, uh, coffee is so nerdy that we have coffee competitions. And I've competed, Reggie's competed, Adam's competed. Has anyone else on stage competed? Dante. Dante did prelims. So, oh, hell yeah. So you've been in coffee competitions in other cities. So do you feel like you have to rep DC super hard when you're not here? <laughs> That's a complicated question because I'm an Ohioan first, but um, no, like I um, I think my first year competing was the year I met you in Austin. Um, I think that I kind of did, but I think that like the um, last year in New Orleans and Hopefully this year in Nashville, it hasn't happened yet. So like, I don't like anything can happen between now and Nashville, but like, I am good at a very few things. And one of them is like building my own personal brand into like who I am. And I think that everybody's pretty aware I'm from DC now. And everybody's like pretty, like it's, it's like baked into who I am. And so I think the first couple of times it was hard, but then um, just like being able um, to talk and have that stage um, is very important for me is why I compete in a lot of ways. And like being able to talk like on Twitter or Instagram or whatever, mostly on Twitter though, to be an artist. And um, like people know who I am and they know that I work in DC and they know how important I think DC is to the coffee community and how like a lot of great baristas have come from DC and gone on to like other cities and like yeah like yeah countries I mean you know like DC is in a lot of ways to me the epicenter of what coffee is so um I think that like at in the routines themselves not necessarily because my routines uh, tend to be pretty dope, and but like, um, how's that arm? Huh? The arm. How's your how's it feeling? From pat myself in the back. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I haven't even begun to flex before. <laughs> um, Good. Uh, no, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm almost. This is this is just straight, Jack. Now nah, this is where we're at. Um, no, like. Um, I mean, like my my last routine in uh, New Orleans. Um, was literally the best routine of the competition. Um, and I, it's on YouTube. If you want it, I can email you it to you. Right? Yeah. 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 He said, watch me. Yeah, like it's, it's there, you know, like something. it was, it 
for like I did it on the Greensboro Four. And if y'all don't know what the Greensboro Four is, then watch my routine and I'll tell you what the Greensboro Four is and how that relates to coffee because it does. Um, yeah. Coffee, like black people, have always been involved in coffee. So like it's, I think that competition for me is um, a way to advance ideas in a more nuanced way because there's very few times in which a large portion, especially coffee industry, is watching you. Um, and I get 10 to 15 minutes in which everybody's eyes are watching me at that moment in time. And I can talk about whatever I want. I can play whatever music I want. Um, I played Wipe Me Down. It was amazing. Um, I also played Back That Ass Up in New Orleans, which was great. Um, it, like, I... <laughs> <laughs> is it dope? Y'all should, like, I'll, I'll tweet it out again later. Y'all, y'all can watch it. Like, it's good. Um, but, like, I, I think that's what competition has for me. is like, it's about being who you are and, like, who I am is in Ohio and working in coffee in D.C. And, like, so D.C. and, like, I'm on the board for DMV Coffee. And, like, so D.C. Coffee very much, like, comes through who I am as a coffee professional when I'm, like, anywhere nationally or internationally or whatever, so... What was it like competing? Yeah. Um, what your experiences? You're an AeroPress champ, aren't you? Yeah. Woo! Yes, top dog right like there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah. Well, it's a little different because you don't have the. A YouTuber, you compete, do you? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, <have video>. no. <laughs> I, I hosted that. I have video. But I don't care. I don't need that, though. <laughs> but I mean, no, like, yeah. So you don't have to. No, what I'll say is you don't have the forum to like advance an idea, like you said. But at the same time, when you think of like, I don't know, when you think of competitions, who do you always see winning? Or for the most part. So just the, like, tall white dudes in long-term relationships. Yes. Tall white dudes in long-term relationships, if you didn't hear that. <laughs> and I'm none of those. That's a no. quote. Beard mustache. Uh, <laughs> Where's the lie? Like, <laughs> <laughs> You're not wrong. So like, They're all in long-term relationships. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> are they? Uh, Lim was the exception, but he's a right. like he's in a long-term relationship. So, okay, <laughs> bringing it <him> back. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's a certain image that we've gotten used to see and holding up some kind of trophy at the, the competition. So, even if it is just the Eurobrass or whatever or whatever competition, if you see someone like me or like Adam or like whoever like standing on it stage or wherever wearing holding up a trophy saying we did this thing and like and, and the thing about the aeropress is like yeah there is no speech but then there's just the coffee you know what i mean so like there's no you can't influence the judges or whatever by you know having this cool performance or anything it's like yeah i can make coffee just as good as anyone else in this competition and it's blind and it's based on just me trusting myself me trusting my skills and i it and that's it, like there's no bias at all. So I like that. I think that's usually why, that's why I probably like the AeroPress War. And because it's like, there's no, I'm not a, I'm not the biggest, I'm not the most verbose person. So I like the idea of just like, I'm just gonna sit here and make the coffee and then you taste it. And if you like it, you like it. If you don't, you don't, but. Cause that's some tea. When I compete, <clears throat> I feel like no matter how cool my routine is, how, Myself, I am. I'm getting docked points for it. Adam, I know you probably can relate. Dante, maybe. Yeah, you're nodding your head. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, why? Why? Yeah, good question. All right, so let me give you an example. Ooh. Wait, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> so Go on. I only competed once, and it was, again, it was the prelim, so uh, Adam and Reggie will always tell me, for years, like, man, you need to compete. Like, you never compete. I'm like, man, you know, I mean, that's not my thing. I just like to, you know, I'm in the cut with it. And then, uh, so this year, I decided to compete. And the biggest thing was, you know, just uh, the coffee experience in D.C. And so I had a theme song. I had this music playing. It was um, Backyard Band. It was Hello. Hey. It was mm-hmm. So that was part of the whole thing. And my coffee shop, we play good music. We serve your coffee. It's about the experience for us. We're professionals at giving you quality coffee, but it's more about did that person enjoy themselves? Do they want to come back? You know what I mean? So 
That was the atmosphere I thought I had put into play. <laughs> and so the performance was good. I got to admit, I, I, didn't, I never practiced a routine. I just winged it the whole time. So that was part of the reason why I did Sounds it. Sounds like dance, Which is cool. And so, you know, I take that on the chin. But one of the judges, like, I, I'm put the music pretty much is the foundation of the whole thing. And one lady was like, you know, I really like the vibe and the music, and you smiled, and the espresso was good, and you forgot to put the towel over, all that type of stuff, right? And the other judge was like, well, I was confused oh, because of the music. So I didn't understand anything. What's it do with the car? <laughs> Can I so, say something know. controversial? Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you feel like white people be complicating shit? <laughs> and, and I, you know... I was going to say I mean this in the best way, but I don't know. <laughs> I don't know best or worst. I just mean, like, what it is. Like, you didn't smile for the people. So that's one. But we'll come back to that. But, like, so I think about, like, our chefs, right? So we have great food at the cafe. And they're always like, don't call me a chef. Like, I didn't go to culinary school. Mm. Bruh. Like, who was cooking before the culinary school? So like, right. we create, not we, excuse me, there gets created these pedigrees that you then have to like move through the maze to then get credentials for stuff that you've always been doing. And then there's technique, there's right. like make something a foam, there's like all this, this, like these complications to then make us like to discredit the the original craftsman in it, right. which is the black person. Right. So like when I think about like my like my, our chefs being like, well, I'm not a chef. I didn't go to culinary school. And I think about like these these like black folks sitting here and being like, yeah, well, I'm competing. And they're telling me where I put up put my rag. I'm also thinking like, what are an amazing you know. White people are crafty as fuck. Like, what an amazing <laughs> way to just remove the farmer from that experience. Like, you used to grow your crop, boil the water, and sit down with your family. You weren't thinking about where you put your rag. You weren't thinking about the shuffle and the smile that went mm -hmm. with it. You were thinking about providing a, a beverage from your hand to your table to now sit and commune with someone and for your village to sit and, like, share that experience to slow down and be in community with each other and now we've like almost been ousted it's been so it's so bougie sounds crazy because like we've taken that word back but it's it's ridiculous like it 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 really is ridiculous to like and it was one of my favorite songs too and you should have been you should have been out there like it was all good you know it was a good experience it's not, you know I don't even like Adele but I like that version of that song I mean you it, know. It, the thing is like I'm sure the, the song was dope and like you were in your vibe but it's just it's just crazy like that's become the coffee industry and it's not about the people growing the coffee it's not about and like there's so much wealth in the middle you know and so like all this stuff and then to make us feel like why am I getting dock points because I'm not music choice? Why am I getting dock points? Like, why is this white guy with the long term, even though I believe in long term relationships? I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying, saying if we typecast in a winner, then let a bitch win. That's all. <laughs> if it's a long term relationship that gives you the trophy, then I would like the trophy. <laughs> but like, what I'm, I'll coach you. My main point is just like, if it's the white dude with the, the tattoos, like that, that, and that's the same with the chefs. That's the same, like, with the industry, and, like, that's because we've allowed pedigrees to trump what has always been our craft. Like, we have always been cooks, we have always been growers, we've always been, and so, like, when do we just say, like, y'all are overcomplicating shit, and, like, and that's to, like, give you validation and remove the validation from what we've ultimately mm. always been doing. Mm -hmm. yes. I think part of that is actually why I compete. Like, and I think that um, if you watch um, either one of my routines, which are both on YouTube, <laughs> <laughs> is that YouTube.com? YouTube, somebody, come on! Yeah. <laughs> Mine. Um, I, like, I, like I'm, I'm always myself. Like, I'm always like the thing I, um, I said at the first Black Coffee is that like this year I'm going to really try to stop code switching, um, mm -hmm. and like I think that I am legitimately myself all the time. Like anybody who knows me, whether you know me, like in real life, where you first met me on Twitter, like, you are generally going to say, like, yeah, that's 
exactly who Adam is all the time. Like I just, I, I yeah. my routines, like the music I played is the music I wanted to play at that point in time. That's what I was feeling. I didn't put any three six mafia on there, but only because I had ten minutes, not fifteen. <laughs> um, but like I think that part of the reason why I compete <laughs> is so that other people can be like, he looks like me. He listens to the same music that I, that I do. Um, he, we, we have this shared history in a lot of ways. I feel like I can do that too. Yes. And I think that that's very important to me. Like, I don't, I don't ever think I'm going to win for, like, my last routine. They told me that they didn't see the story in my routine, which when I tell you is the most laughable thing in the entire world. My entire routine was all story. It was, it was beautiful. This one's better. The one I'm writing right now is better. But if there's other people out there, like there's two, like like um, Dante competed in prelims. Anthony, that's now in New York, he competed in prelims and he's going to be in Nashville with me too. Like when people tell me that like you inspired me to compete, yep. that's why I do it. And that's all I care about. I never plan on winning. Yeah. And well, I, this wasn't a personal yeah. critique no. about you. No, no, no. no. The industry. And then I think the critique of like us needing the accreditation of white people and like that's when we feel like it's black excellence as opposed to like this is trash (laughs) and my routine i don't even know what a routine is it sounds like i'm a gymnast so i don't know yeah it's it's it's, it's not it's not not far off off. my point is like more around the industry to create all these things that like again remove it from it being about black hands to a, a black community experience, which is what it you know black and brown. I never want to like you know not get pay homage to that. Um, but my you know so my point wasn't around how dope your routine was. My yeah. point is like y'all should go compete. You know I would put some Biggie in there, but I, I you know there's no judgment if y'all don't want to put Biggie in there. But it's not about. Like, it. Yo. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. But it's, it's not specific. I'm, mean, you know, it's it's never. I you know I, I can critique black people, but I rarely do because I think like we live in a constructed maze. But my thing is like, why is that the maze? Like, let's be honest. Like, that's not. Again, this is my controversial perspective. I do not speak on behalf of black people. Okay. I do actually. Uh, you know, I'm just like the critique is is just like this idea around having to be pedigreed all the time, like having to compete, having to like stand next to some white dude who's now claiming that this is the coffee industry when like that's that's not the coffee industry. And like I'm I'm glad you compete. I would I don't know if I could vote for your routine if it's like clap based. Oh, you know, if I could load in, I don't know how it works. But what I do know is that, like, we are, we constantly seek accreditation and validation for shit that we've always been doing. This is our industry, you know, like this is our shit, and so, um, and that's how I feel about like the culinary world too. And one of the reasons why you just get in this drip coffee is because, like, is this this is the farmer, this is the roaster. This is the brew. Like this yeah. this is like the sit down and like let's let's vibe over this. And so um I just like go back to like like white people just make us like like they exit us out of our story and it's like we're at the beginning and we're at the end, but they take the middle and they make mm-hmm. that the thing and then we have no place in it mm-hmm. other than feeling like we gotta be in because like we have to show there has to be representation, like or just fuck that thing. Like, like no, that's whack as fuck. Not that it's whack. I'm sure, like I'm saying, I look at your routine on YouTube. It's on YouTube. Right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not search saying, Adam Jackson it, it really is not about your routine and your routine. No, it's like, I would like and subscribe. To too. It's just more around this idea of always feeling like, or not us always feeling like this idea that white people can then tell us, like, you have to be credentialed in something to be validated in something, and then they set the metrics of what those credentials are on shit we've been doing. So, like, that's confusing to me. So that was just my point, and then I'll I'll go I'll go back to listening. No, I mean, like, that's like I, like it's a point well taken, and and it's it's something I think about regularly. I like I constantly think whether or not I should compete because like I don't know like whether or not they can measure the skills that I do have. I don't think that the skills set needed to be a great barista is ever 
exemplified in barista competition. Mm -hmm. um, but I also do know that like if other people feel inspired by it, I like, and it's something that because of the way my mind works and because of the things I like to do and because I am by nature a super competitive person and I like to like not just win but destroy other people. <laughs> um, it's something I really, I really enjoy doing, and and so like it's, you're right that in a lot of ways that like it feels like I'm measuring myself up to what other people think is important, but at the same time I'm also able to change what people think a barista looks like or a barista competitor looks like. So it's like like they're part of the. Part of the hard thing, but also part of the beauty to me in being black, is that like we're dealt this hand that isn't amazing. You know what I mean? And we're expected to like to do like we're expected to do the bare minimum in a lot of ways um, because there's all these things that are stacked against us. And what we do do is is we build community. And one thing that I have done through competing is like built a community of friends and people that like like legitimately love me because of who I am as a person. So like I think that it winning the competition isn't the end goal for me. The end goal is like going to other cities and saying like this is what DC coffee is, this is who I am, this is what black people in coffee is, and I'm recognizing that I'm representing all those things at one time. So like it's like you're right in a lot of ways. But and blowing up the industry in a lot of ways does feel like what we should be working on. But I've always believed that there's two kinds of people. There's kinds of people that run towards the fire to put it out and kinds of people and the kind of people that run away from the fire. I'd rather run towards the fire and like try to like rebuild that house versus saying like I I let me start something new because I recognize how hard to start something new is. But where my skill set lies is in fixing and rebuilding things that other people have fucked up before. Like, I love chaos. That's, that's why I thrive. So, like, that's the reason. That's, uh, like, it's a very complex. Like, if you ask me tomorrow, how do you feel about competing? <clears throat> I'd be like, I hate this shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, so I, I, yeah, so it's like it's a... The question isn't whether you should compete. The question is, should, like, is more around the idea of, ped like, the pedigree around industries that have always been ours. Like, I think that that's my that's my challenge. Like, are we existing within constructions that have been given up to us, and do we then have a right to shine within them? Yeah, absolutely. And I don't think we've been dealt a bad. I think maybe we've been dealt a bad hand if you play in hearts, but I'm playing spades, so my hand looks really good. Like, so I so that's not the concept that I'm working with. I'm saying that this is like. This is a complication to an industry that we have been a part of to then move us out of and create wealth within without our bodies there. And then to make us jump through hoops to feel like we should be able to enter. So you should compete. I would vote for you. But that my critique isn't about you competing. My critique is about the industry at large. And I want to jump in and say I think this, this really brings to light why ownership is so important why creating mm -hmm. our own environments um, is so important, why having, um, having our own uh, communities, cafes, ownerships, uh, our own kind of measures for ourselves is so important. Um, and it doesn't mean that those are going to be different or lower. If anything, they're going to be higher, you know, because um, we'll be judging ourselves. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And so um, I think uh, and I think that's something that all of us on this panel are trying to are trying to really gain ownership over what we're yes. doing, um, over our businesses, over, you know, our our careers and um, and, and our, our professional and personal development. So. I was uh, real quick to kind of peel in on that. Um, I owned a business too a few years ago. I used to run a bar that was right down the street. Um, it was called it was called Pharmacy Bar. It took over like in the last like year of existence. And I remember this one night, uh, these two young brothers walk in and they're like just kind of looking around. And 
they like they're just like I went up to them and was like, hey, how you doing? Welcome to the bar. And I was like, my name's Reggie. I'm the owner. And they're like, like you like the look on their faces was like just because they saw me look like one of them, like wearing t-shirt and jeans, saying, hey, I'm I, I'm owning I own this business like that. Like I've never forgotten that day. I ended up you know certain things happen. I don't own the bar anymore. But like just that moment, just seeing them be like. You know, like it, it felt good, and it's important. Um, just kind of like, and it's candy, like owning, run her business. Like, like it's, it's it's very important that people see us not just winning, um, but owning, like, or managing, or these are all like seeing us in positions of leadership and and like pushing things forward. That's very necessary to like, like I don't, I don't, I mean, if I, if I never run a cafe, that's fine. But if people, if someone I trained. Goes on to like do that, and they, and then if I had any role, any small part to play in that, then I'm I'm fine with that. I feel like DC has a uh, there's a real opportunity here for a lot of people that look like us to go that route. Um, despite some of the financial barriers and space issues, there's still a space for us to just come here and, and run shit like we want to. Um, versus in other places where they do make it a lot harder for no other reason other than for us being black. Uh, but to sort of wrap this up, I want to ask all of you, what do you think What do you think the future of DMV cafe culture is going to look like? What is it going to be like in the next five years? Because it's changed so much <laughs> in the last five since I've been gone. But I think that Chocolate Barista is going to host their own competition that's what I think. <laughs> I mean, I'm a visionary. I'm always thinking up shit. That sounds great. Yep. And there will be no like long term tattooed tall white guy winning. All my relationships been short, so. Actually, I'm like I haven't had a relationship, so <laughs> that's what I mean by short. <laughs> Yeah, what do the rest of y'all think? Five years from now. <sighs> hmm. Man, that's an impossible question. Not impossible, but like it's just just because it's changed so much in the last five years. Mm. What do you want it to look like? I want it to look <laughs> I want it to take back the chocolate part of the chocolate city. Mm. Chocolate city. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a there's a certain I'm not gonna like name names, but there's a certain local coffee chain that's rapidly growing up, blown up in this city. They have cafes everywhere. Um, name names. I'm not gonna. Uh, I'm not gonna name names. We'll not here. Afterwards. Oh. Uh, but anyway, like, I, and it's good for them. They they had a nice little write up in the post the whole time that they're building out their cafe, but. Um, I want to see more. I want to see like someone write about write about us. I want to see us. I want to see us cafes run by us, opening up in just as many spots as they are. Um, I think that's important. Um, maybe we'll see some like southeastern roastery <laughs> cafes around yeah. the city. You know, yeah. whatever. Like, I think that's. I think that's a viable future. Yeah. If we make it, so. I, I like that. <laughs> Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> um, you know that area along, you know, that uh, kind of squares around the White House, you know? <laughs> if those were all cafes of color, Ooh. that would be awesome oh, yeah. for me. <laughs> he doesn't drink coffee anyway, though. Come on. Yay! Oh, please come on the mic, man. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I really like the Woo! I let over Mm-hmm. And that same look that you're talking about happens to us every day. Mm-hmm. And white desserts for everybody, too. 
Oh. Woohoo! Wow. There is cake. People say, oh, you guys are black, you were Canadian, yeah. you know? And, you know, aside from this, I have something called Black Brand Nation, which talks about the importance of black brands and the power of our spending. We're worth $1.7 trillion in cash spending. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. This is the right here, as bad as I don't know what, because a lot of people don't know what happened when they're my way. But they legislatively blessed um, white privilege. Mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. People wow. were in yeah. spaces that they shouldn't be in. Yeah. They created legislation to say, this is ours, and we want that back. Mm -hmm. So I just want for us to be able to articulate. We can talk about these things that come with white culture. Right privilege is what we're concerned about. And I have a very good friend who's white we talk all the time. He always says, oh, then should I pay for the sins of my father? And I say, but who will pay for the deaths of mine? Mm -hmm. And at this point, it's a very uncomfortable conversation to address white privilege and what it is, how it's been handled legislatively in our country, mm -hmm. and that we want to be the only country that has been invested properly. If you go to New Zealand, if you read about Amanada Diallo, who testified, you know, about you know, the slave trade, if you mm -hmm. look, it's a legislative issue that has not been addressed here. But the larger issue is the power of our dollars, the power of us collectively coming together. Mm -hmm. And we don't need the assistance of white people to succeed, but we do need the inclusion to yes. be done. And we have to be yes. able to articulate what that looks like. Mm -hmm. I was invited here by a white person. No black person told me to come here. And she was like, this is for you. Mm -hmm. So I just want to make sure that we articulate you know, what we want and how we want it. But the reason that I've studied black spending for 20 years and dedicated my life to because I don't want to be the smartest black girl in the room. Mm -hmm. I just want for someone to value what we have and rest mm -hmm. mm -hmm. That's it. It's not, I don't want the handicap. I don't want the handout. We simply right. just want to sit at the table. And all of our communities are now the prime property. Mm -hmm. So we have to own a little bit of not facing our own property. But we also have to figure out how do we get the ability and the capital to go into a space and have Starbucks and come You know, there's a place in Milwaukee called Coffee Nation Black. I went to their grand opening. They're friends of my family. They're black coffee house in Milwaukee. They have a second location now. The line is around the corner. So when we're branding, why are we branding? Are we in smart spaces? But do we have our conversation correct? Mm -hmm. And the beautiful thing about this panel is we can do everything with what we have to do. We have someone who has the voice to bring everyone together. We have a roaster here. Mm -hmm. I, I did not <laughs> but there was so much power in this room that I could not leave. So I just want to make sure that we understand that it will be inclusion. It will be super cool white people who will help us. And their spendership is what will push our businesses yeah, right. forward. But we want a commercial space, and we need it at a discounted rate. Because we oh. walk past that raggedy building for 15 years and nobody wanted to do it. Yep. So I just think we have to articulate our questions, our message, what we want from our legislators. And honestly, you all, I know everybody wants to be in this but the money is in Africa. Mm -hmm. And we really need to go back to Africa and look at business opportunities there. And then come back after you have a phone book in London and decide mm -hmm. to keep whatever building you want to keep in because you're caked up. So let's right. just think about our argument. But together, no one can stop us. And we have to be clear. The one thing I love about the lady who owns the roasting company is she knows what she's good at. She's like, look, I don't want to talk to nobody. So <laughs> make sure that you're clear about what you do and what you do well. Mm -hmm. But then also, as black people, we can be unapologetically black. And this is what I love about the Go Cafe, and I'm coming to Boston more today. Come on. <laughs> Come on. We have lost the beauty of a simple conversation. And when you come to Danielle's Cafe, I welcome everyone like their family. My parents are from Mississippi. We're a southern bakery, but we value time. Somebody in here may not wake up tomorrow. We were all here together today, and that's truly what matters, the, the strength of the community. And as the sister said, no one can resell me something that they don't. Mm -hmm. Starbucks is Starbucks blown up. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the communities where their coffee comes from, 
they are African people who are procuring this coffee. And they may put a little picture of the Starbucks. They showed you that community. But what, where would those communities be if they had their own brands of right. actual coffee shops? Mm -hmm. So it's an interesting and touchy you know, situation. But I just want to say thank you for, mm -hmm. for offering me this opportunity to come here. I didn't know it would change things in the way you know, that wow. it did. I will nice. offer my time and effort. So I can barely make a lot of things. She taught me how to make a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> We're a bakery, but we do have this coffee space. So this is a beautiful thing. And I do personally love coffee. I drink it every single day. Um, I was a Starbucks fan, and so I ran into uh, Lenora. I have been dabbling into other specialty coffees. So um, I'm just thankful to be here, and I think this is just something absolutely mm -hmm. mm -hmm. wow. Thank you. Thank you. I know, yeah. I should have asked you to be a panelist. Bring another seat. Thanks for the desserts. I am so excited about those. Well, um, well, before we completely wrap up, we do have some time, some time for some questions. Okay. Q and A. So in Portland. We had a situation where I said, this is not the moment for non-black people to grab the microphone and say, what can I do to be better? And you know what happened? <laughs> a white woman got on the mic and said, I know you said this, but what can I do <laughs> to be better? We answered the question, it was fine. Good thing I didn't have a microphone. Uh, but, and then in New York, I just banned white people all together from getting on the mic. Uh, but y'all seem like a very respectful crowd, and it's actually, this is the most diverse crowd we've had, and I'm very happy. Yes, DC. <laughs> yes, DC. <laughs> That's what I, what I expected. So, yeah, if anyone has a question for us, or if we have questions for each other, I'll take two. Oh, okay. Two and two only. Yes. Don't hurt yourself. Hello. Okay, so I randomly came across this on Twitter. I was like, I'm literally a brand new barista. I've only been doing this for like two, three weeks. Um, so I was like, something told me to come out. Um, so I was like, I'm going to name names because I don't know what, like, literally this is my first experience with the D.C. Um, coffee community. Born and raised in PG County, but never really... I was a tea girl until I got this job. So like in the same <laughs> kind of vein, like the coffee is, was a vehicle for me kind of just to work and like it's a hustle, you know? I'm like starting this new thing. I was like, I work at Blue Bottle, which might be one of the things yeah. that you mentioned, but I'm glad that I'm here because, because I'm brand new. It's good that I'm getting the chance to hear what people who've been doing this for 80,000 like years here, who've been here like <laughs> forever. Next time just add me, yeah. all right? You know. <laughs> I was like, it's good that I'm here to kind of see the new moisturizer. what DC coffee people have been doing before they got here. Cause they're brand new market. They literally just got here. And I'm glad to hear that you have a roastery. Cause they really supposedly pride themselves on like knowing where their coffee comes from and like, being a part of the communities that they come to. That's literally what they have said, like when they bring us on for training. And I asked them how. And they were saying, like, they do, they give out coffee and stuff like that. They want everybody to be welcome. But what's a way that I feel like, even though I'm part of this, like, chain, that I can kind of do something to make them really be about what they're supposed to be about in the community? Supposedly. I know it's a hard question. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, <it's easy. laughs> Go in, Adam. At Blue Bottle? <laughs> well, just got there, so maybe this is a big question. No, that's the answer. That's the answer to my question. Is at Blue Bottle? <laughs> it's not. It's, it's not going to happen. Blue Bottle's owned by Nestle. Um, by it's, Nestle? Yeah. You better name names. <laughs> um, it's, it's not going to happen. I'm like, to be perfectly honest that. with you, like... I mean, that's um, real, that's real. They... My bad, though. <laughs> Do you need a barista? <laughs> <laughs> that's how it happens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Basically. <laughs> yeah, like, that's... Like, the, the, the answer to your question is probably not going to be found at Blue Bottle. Um, and I... I have friends that have worked for Blue Bottle that 
amazing coffee people, both of them left within like three months. Mm. You know, like I'm new there, so I'm like seeing things as I go. But it's definitely like since I'm new to the technique and everything, I definitely think there's a lot for me to learn. There oh, for sure. Yeah. No, like it's it's like that. yeah, it's definitely that coffee information. You're gonna get all that over there, yeah. but the other stuff. But like learn that, <laughs> learn that, and then take it somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. like be, become a, a trainer somewhere. Learn that and bring it to Southeastern. Yeah, Songbird. Yeah, Songbird. Yep. Yeah, I get to run around. <laughs> Hey everyone, and I know some people on the stage. They're so excited. Um, I'm new to coffee too. I, um, I've uh, started last year around almost uh, the holidays, and I run like a, a coffee Instagram called Rabbit and the Fox. And um, I'm a barista now, but now that I've been like meeting so many different people and going to like throwdowns and stuff, I'm really big on like lifestyle. And a big part of my lifestyle is coffee and then fashion. And I'm like, how can I bring that together? But then I like, but I love, I love experience. And I love events, because I do music, so I throw an event for myself to perform for people. So I'm just like, well, shit, how can I do this with coffee? You know what I mean? Without being the empty brain of like, oh, well, what is this? I'm just like, oh, no. But then I have this part where everyone's like, oh, you'll be great in wholesale. And I'm just like, I have to sell stuff. Hmm. So it's just like, for someone who's curious and trying to like find their way in coffee and um, be able to make it, make, make a, a living and to also um, pick the right spot, whether it be, because I told my supervisor, I'm like, I want to figure out about roasting because you don't have to talk to people. And you could be in a, in a factory at 5 a.m. <laughs> by yourself. And I love to just touch and be around coffee. It's really weird. And I'm just like, I have a need to be a roaster. But everyone's like, no, you should be in wholesale. And like another of our wholesale reps is like, no, you should just be in customer service. You're good people. And I'm like, no. But um, as a new barista who is trying to figure out, like, where I want to be in coffee, like, what would you suggest the first steps to getting to know more about, like, wholesale or, like, um, even if it's, like, an event or something? Because I, I will be honest, like, I'm good at a lot of different things, but I don't know what I'm great in in this this in this in this business this this world of coffee because it's like I love it. If I could sit in coffee beans and just smell them, wow. I would <laughs> do it because it's just like I love coffee. <laughs> but then it's like there's more to it. So like when I'm not at work, I'm like reading my little uh, the coffee book that teach you like all the different <laughs> brews and beans, and I'm asking questions. But then also too, I'm trying not to ask too many because I do feel that I, uh, some people feel like oh she's too curious and she may want to step on my toes, you know, because there's only a certain amount of wholesalers or these people in this city or this state, and it's just like, but I got to get in where I fit in so I could get the ball rolling because I'm, I'm, like, itching to, like, learn as much as I can and just to know, like, what's the best thing to do to, like, grow in that field if I want to learn about wholesaling or get into, like, events and stuff like that. Wow. Hi, my name is Michelle, and I was you seven years ago. Oh. <laughs> and honestly, like when it's funny because people ask me, like Michelle, what do you do? And I'm like, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I made my own way in coffee. I was a barista, and you now I did management, and I did education. But the chocolate barista was my outlet into doing something else like I I left coffee for a year to work in freelance creative marketing and stuff like that and I was like you know I eventually want to find a way to bring this together um, so after a year I did you know get a job <coughs> working marketing for a coffee company but ultimately I just wanted to I've been able to just carve out my own space um, and so I like I'm also about fashion and the lifestyle part of, of coffee and like 
because coffee is also my lifestyle. And the whole reason why I started the Chocolate Barista wasn't actually to talk about race. I am an accidental activist. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was a lifestyle blog for a barista. <laughs> and and it just so, you know, obviously being a black woman, that is a part of my lifestyle too. So I was going to talk about it. Um, but one of the, what I found is one of the cool things about the coffee industry, because it's so young, is that yeah, you don't have to, that people think they're like these traditional ways of having to be in coffee. You don't need to do all that. Like there's a lot of space to create anything you want. So if it's like, if you want to get paid to lay in beans and smell them, someone will pay you. <laughs> like whether it's a specialty Good coffee job. company or honestly, girl, go to commodity. They got the money. <laughs> like ask Lavazza to take some photos of you chilling in some beans, I guess. It's fucking <laughs> weird. <laughs> But there is there is a lot of space for you to do whatever it is you want and and bring coffee into it. So if if that's music, hell, we all need playlists at our cafes and stuff like that. Go ahead, Candy. Dude, you could like make beats off of the roasting cracks, like first crack, second crack, percolator. Do you know the dude who made it's, it's time, time for the percolator? percolator. <laughs> it's time for the percolator. It was, an, was an engineer <laughs> no. who was DJing while he was engineering. Like, and he made this song about percolating because what do chemical engineers learn about percolation? Like, I mean, how badass is that? So there, like, it's limitless. Like, mm -hmm. whatever you want to do, do it. Literally whatever you want to do, there's always going to be a way to tie coffee into it. And you may not know exactly what that looks like now. We may not be able to tell you exactly what that looks like. But you can, you can, you'll be able to figure it out as you go. And um, now you have all of these lovely people who will help you. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're we're all out here trying to do the damn thing, and I, you know, I'm not getting paid to be the chocolate barista full time yet, but soon. And when I do, I'll give you the keys. <laughs> so yeah, well, <clears throat> that's Black Coffee DC, y'all. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> See you soon. Have a good night. Thank you all on the panel. We can we can leave. <laughs>